We had an interesting conversation with Theodore Dalrymple, not least because he and I share the experience of being psychiatrists and dealing with a wide range of psychiatric and personality difficulties in different settings. Theodore Dalrymple has been a prison physician and a psychiatrist. He's worked in the East End of London and in City Hospital Birmingham and Winston Green Prison also in Birmingham. He's a prolific writer. He's written for the British Medical Journal, The Times, The Observer, The Daily Telegraph, The Spectator, many other newspapers and journals. And he's written a number of books, the most well-known of which is Life at the Bottom. He um, bases much of his writing on his experience of working with criminals and the mentally ill. And one of the things that we found when talking to him is that he shares both uh, Jill and my black humour about the appalling circumstances that we have found our clients or our patients to be in. Could you tell us about your work in the prisons? Well, I uh, was a psychiatrist there. I, I used to go in the afternoons uh, to the prison, which was uh, next door to the hospital. Actually, I used to, I used to uh, walk every day, almost every day, from the hospital to the prison. It was about six hundred yards, <laughs> right. and uh, and uh, the atmosphere deteriorated uh, as you got nearer the hospital. And, uh, <laughs> nearer the hospital. <laughs> nearer the hospital. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and I, so I saw uh, lots and lots of prisoners there. Uh, principally in the uh, prison hospital, but also uh, on what were called the wings. And I was also on duty for ordinary medical uh, work uh, at weekends and uh, at night, uh, about one night in three or four for about 14 years. So was it mostly psychiatric? Uh, consultations or... during the during the day it was although not in not entirely uh, but in the evening i mean uh, i um it would be anything it could right. be anything so uh, what, what kinds of things were were you being asked to see uh, during the day yes well, there was the assessment of whether there was something wrong or not, uh, psychiatrically wrong, with the patient. And actually, I came to respect the prison officer's judgment. They were not perhaps highly educated men, but they were people of practical experience who were very good at spotting when there was something uh, a bit odd. So they would come up to me and say, could you see Smith, sir? He's, uh, he's behaving a bit strange. And... Uh, and on the whole, they were very good at distinguishing between uh, um, real psychiatric disorder and and uh, difficult, just difficult behaviour or people losing their temper and so on. Um, and uh, I had other very odd things to do. So, for example, when a, a prisoner was placed on report, I had to, that is to say, he was supposed to have broken a rule or something and was subject to mild punishment um, of some kind. I had to assess whether he was um, compos mentis, as it were. Yeah. And um, uh, that was the kind of thing I had to do. Often I, I uh, used to write to uh, I used to write to um, to lawyers uh, of patient of prisoners on remand if I thought that they were psychiatrically uh, disturbed and they needed a psychiatric report. I didn't do the psychiatric report myself, uh, <clears throat> but I suggested that they got a psychiatric report because there was something wrong with the with the person. And to a surprise, in a surprising number of cases, the um, the lawyers hadn't seemed to have noticed. <laughs> and were, you, were you dealing with like the full range of serious mental illness, like schizophrenia, oh, yes. and bipolar disorder? Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah. I mean, we had, uh, and and actually, that was. <clears throat> I think it was getting worse because, of course, there was no. The prison was almost the first port of call for, for, uh, for us obviously psychiatrically unwell patients who had done something 
that uh, the law became involved with, but there were there were no places for them, and there were no psychiatric hospitals. And quite interestingly, in the city, uh, all the psychiatric hospitals had virtually been closed down, and they soon found themselves obliged to build. Um, there was a larger number. There were a larger number of secure places now than ordinary places. Right. So, in other words, we've been building what amount to psychiatric hosp- uh, prisons in place of psychiatric hospitals. And these people weren't um, remanded. You know, they weren't in. They weren't in secu- They weren't. They hadn't been sent to a secure hospital. They'd simply be sent to prison. Yes, we because of the Broadmoor or the. Uh, oh no, no, hospitals. no, no! But I mean, the the, the uh, secure units. But there were not enough places, and so. Mm. So they just got sent to prison. And then it was quite often very difficult to get them out again because there were no places. Uh, and, and, it, and I suppose, I mean, I'm, my surmise was that uh, the secure units then put the prisoners at the bottom of the queue because they felt that they were already being looked after, although... Of course, we couldn't. We were not allowed to treat them against their will in prison, and there's a good reason why we shouldn't be allowed to. But it also meant that they often spent uh, weeks or months um, uh, in a terrible, uh, terrible condition. Um, but at least they had somewhere secure. Well, was... so were they in shared cells, or? Um... Well, it depends. I mean, if they were too disturbed, no. Hmm. I mean, in the prison hospital, no, they were not in shared cells. Um, so, but, but, but um, anyway, I, I got quite exercised about that. I could give you, I can give you some interesting anecdotes. I don't know whether you want any. Yeah. We do. What yeah. kind of thing are you talking about? Well, I, I'll give you the most extreme anecdote that uh, I have, and that is of a man who was brought to prison. Um, uh, who had attacked a lady at a church for no very obvious reason. He he hadn't, um, I mean, in the sense he wasn't robbing her. There was no obvious reason why he should have attacked her. It was quite out of the blue. And when he was brought in, it was perfectly obvious he was mad and he was sent to the... the, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'd have to be a psychiatrist not to spot that he was a man. <laughs> <laughs> With years of training. Years of training, yes. <laughs> Fail to spot <laughs> mental illness. Yeah. And so anyway, he was in a cell, and uh, he was stark naked. He stripped himself naked. He didn't eat. Uh, he... Uh, addressed the world through the bars of his... Uh, cell addressing people who clearly were not there he he daubed in his own excrement religious type um, slogans mm. on his cell wall <laughs> one of the most memorable things was when the psychiatrist came who had known him to assess him for taking him to hospital said that he was merely um, in effect play acting <laughs> interesting and, and this went on this went on for quite a long time and it was intolerable for everyone it was intolerable for the other prisoners the whole place smelled of excrement the prison officers it was terrible for them uh, and so on and he was up at night shouting and so on and in the end what i did i mean i got fed up with the refusal of the nhs to take him so what i did is i got the hospital uh, the prison uh, photographer to come and take a photograph of his cell, and I uh, and I uh, wrote uh, spoke to the uh, to the um, psychiatrist who who should have, in my view, have taken him, and said, "I am now sending these photographs to the Home Secretary." <laughs> And I'm going to ask him whether he thinks that prisoners should be kept in these conditions. And mysteriously, after several weeks, the next day, a place became available for him. And I must say, the prison governor was very good. He was was the best prison governor we had. Um, And he came to me afterwards and he said, did you have photographs taken of this man's service? I said, yes. He said, that is completely against the rules, he said. 
well done. Yes, <laughs> but, but this, um, the boundary between between pretending and being mentally ill is a is 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 always a, a an interesting challenge, isn't it? Um, because some people will pretend to be mentally ill. But I think it's actually very difficult to keep it up. Yes. I mean, I, get, I don't think you. I don't think it's easy to pretend to be psychotic, actually, mm. for for any length of time. And nor do I think it's possible to pretend to be manic, for example. Mm. Do you think and, it's possible and, to pretend to have a disturbed personality, a personality disorder? Well, I suppose if you want to have a disturbed personality, you have a disturbed personality. Well, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what about a person who consistently lies? Is consistently lying? Pseudologia fantastica. Is that is that a mental disorder? But I, but in in if in if in effect, the the more serious uh, psychiatric disturbances, like uh, bipolar um, yeah. disorder or. Um, or schizophrenia, I don't think it's easy to, to manufacture them. It's easier to pretend to be depressed because these days people uh, know exactly what they have to do to get some kind of diagnosis, which is so loose. But again, it's not easy to, uh, to fake severe melancholia or psychotic depression. That, that's not easy. How, how, would you, how would you pick out the person who was... Uh, actually depressed from the person who was wanting to you know gain some benefit by being thought to be depressed well one of the things one i did was to admit them to the to the to the hospital wing to observe them yeah and if on the one hand they claimed to be so depressed they couldn't eat or uh, sleep or, or or so on uh, but actually they were after a time very cheerful uh that suggested to me that they were and this was the method actually that we use when I started my psychiatric career what is it now 45 years ago yeah you 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 didn't just someone didn't just come and say uh, I'm unhappy and then the doctor gives out the antidepressants you actually saw whether they were seriously you you admitted them if you thought it was serious enough and observed them uh, and you could do that in the prison because you had the, the the prison hospital wing. So you could actually observe their behavior, whether it was consistently depressed or whether they were depressed only when they came into your consulting room. More, more of a challenge is when people actually, uh, well, threaten to harm themselves, threaten to kill themselves, or do actually harm themselves in order to have the same impact. That That uh, is a challenge, isn't it? Yes. Well, I, again... Um, we had, of course, some self-harm. We had, of course, occasional suicides as well. Um, and we had lots of threats. And, of course, we not only had threats of suicide or harm to, um, to, to the person himself, but threats to others. Of so, course, that, yeah. so, for example, I had a patient who said um, that if I didn't give him something to calm him down, he was going to um, attack people and possibly kill people, especially sex offenders. And obviously sex offenders are, are sometimes attacked. That's why they have to be kept separate from, from other prisoners. Um, and um, I, I refused to to give in to what seemed to me to be blackmail. But, of course, in the back of my mind was the possibility that he would carry out his threat. And he had already said, if, if I carry out someone, uh, carry out this threat, it will be your fault. Very manipulative. It's very manipulative. Mm. Uh, and you, you can't be absolutely sure that he's not going to do it. But what I said was... If you carry out this threat, it will not be my fault. The responsibility is yours. Mm. Sure. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, I would have... He didn't, in fact, carry out his threat, but I would have felt rather bad if he had. Mm. It is easier in a, in a secure environment to do these tests on people because there's, there's somebody kind of watching and able to intervene if, if they start to act on their threats. It's a, it's, a, it's a little easier 
Um, because I, I, ran um, the, yes. I ran the intensive care unit in Oxford for a while, and I remember admitting a woman who was determined to kill herself. Um, and because of all she was demanding extra medication, she, was, she started banging her head against the uh, bedroom wall and was banging away all day and all night and wore a hole in her forehead in doing so. And um, we refused to up her medication on that basis that she was simply demanding it uh, but she uh, continued to um, make rather dramatic gestures about trying to kill herself which was difficult in an intensive care unit um, but but shortly after this had all started uh, the staff had to restrain her and while she was being held on the floor I was able to have a conversation with her pointing out that we weren't going to allow her to kill herself in the intensive care unit because it would be very bad for all of us uh, for that to happen. It wouldn't look good. Um, and the way she would have to deal with this would be to behave in a very reasonable way uh, so that we could discharge her, and then she could kill herself if that's what she still wanted to do. Uh, and she got the message, in fact, and did, in fact, start to behave herself in a very reasonable way, um, to the point where she was able to go out from the intensive care unit and go shopping, uh, and then knock on the locked door to be allowed back in again because the other wards in the hospital wouldn't take her because she was regarded as too much of a risk. Uh, and she, in fact, was discharged perfectly successfully, having... And didn't kill herself. And, and didn't kill herself, no. Was there, was there anything wrong with her, in your opinion? I mean, any yes. genuine psychiatric illness? Well, she had been sexually abused throughout her childhood by her father and then by her brothers, and... Her current life was with her two daughters, which social services had just become involved with. Uh, the, the, the brothers were coming in and were still sexually abusing her at night, and she was submitting to it to protect her children. Good and Lord. she um, was in a terrible predicament um, uh, mm. and, and didn't know how to escape from the situation. Because if she admitted what was happening, social services would probably remove her children. Um, and if she allowed it to continue, it was, it was likely the children would get involved in any case. Uh, she couldn't protect them. So, uh, there, there, it, could you, I don't know, you, do you call this a psychiatric problem? It's, uh, <laughs> it's not a mental yeah. illness. No, no. I mean, it's, it's the kind uh, of no, stuff that we deal with. Yes, yes. Um, well, I, I, I yes. Uh, yeah, I did. I dealt a, a, with an enormous amount of that kind of thing in the hospital, actually, where yeah. I saw a, probably between ten and fifteen thousand cases of overdose, or usually overdose rather than self harm, but some sort of yes. some. And uh, and of course, most of these people, most of the people. I mean, it was of varying degrees of severity, of course, but many of the people had intolerable situations. Yeah. And one, the only thing I could do, I think, is to put into their mind that there was some kind of solution other than merely accepting it. And I don't, you know, obviously they had to, to, to reflect on it. It wasn't something that they could to do, change their lives overnight. And perhaps... Uh, they they were ambivalent about changing, of course, because they weren't all of the severity that you've just described. But um, the man that they loved was a monster, for example. Well, the alternative can seem worse, can't it? But the alternative can seem worse, yes. Because you're and on Sarah, your own in the world. You're on your own, and and it, not only that, but it's not the kind of world in which it's a good thing to be on your own because you will be exploited or uh, so. So it was a it was a horrible world, actually. It was awful, um, uh, but it wasn't a psychiatric it wasn't a psychiatric condition in the way that say uh, schizophrenia is a psychiatric condition. Um, so would you, would you, were you able to admit people who were in that situation or would you manage them somehow in spite of the risks, um, uh, you know, as outpatients? Oh, well, I, uh, most of them were outpatients and I was rather anxious not to medicalise it. 
Because, of course, once you start medicalizing it, uh, then you transfer the responsibility for doing something about it to the doctor. And uh, you, you give tablets, which you know perfectly well, have a very small chance of making any difference. But plenty of and chance actually, of side effects, in fact. Yeah, yes, yes. So, uh, and then, of course, once you start giving out, this was my view, once you start giving out tablets to people, uh, they think that there's something wrong with them. Um, mm. and therefore um, when your tablets don't work then of course you can increase the dose and then when those don't work you can change the tablets uh, to other tablets and it, this pas de deux as it were can go on for a long time and eventually uh, often you're forced to say well there's nothing wrong with you anyway <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well there's something wrong with your situation but not with you uh, yes yeah. so I, I, uh, so I spent far more time demedicalizing. Yeah. Because uh, uh, people uh, talk about their mental health very freely now. You know, the, yes. uh, mental health is is a, is almost a kind of cliche, isn't it? Um, it? It subsumes everything from stress and a bit of anxiety to yes. indeed severe mental illness. And yes. um, it's difficult to know quite what people expect. Um, as you, as you well, say, I, if you medicalize things, you don't necessarily do them any favors at all. No, I, I, in fact, I'm against the idea of mental health as such, really. I mean, I, I'm in favor of madness. And, of course, there's no uh, as, as a concept. But there's uh, the problem, of course, is that there's no very sharp dividing line. I mean, you, as on any continuum, there's an obvious uh, extreme. But... For example, in, in many, many years, I don't think I heard anyone say he was unhappy, or very few people say. Uh, I mean, the one person that I heard say it was a prisoner who said, I, I'm unhappy in this prison. Um, and I said, well, I'm very sorry, but I... I <laughs> Not a lot you could do about it. <laughs> well, also, I, I mean, uh, the idea that prison should be a place where people are happy is a rather odd one. But anyhow, um, everyone said he was depressed. Every, he or she said he was depressed. The word unhappiness or unhappy, the words unhappy or unhappiness, have almost disappeared from our lexicon. Yeah. which means that any form of unhappiness has become an illness. Mm. So this implies that the natural state of mankind is to be happy almost all the time. Well, that's jolly nice. And the other thing is the word, the use of shock. People are no longer shocked, they're in shock. Yes. As, and as, as, as you and I know, in, you know, being in shock is a particular state, a physical state. Well, and, it, yes. And not at all the same as being shocked. But it's yes. been medicalized, hasn't it? It's, uh, people have adopted the medical phrase. Yes. Uh, I think, I mean, I mean, part of the problem is that there's no biological marker to distinguish between uh, trivial um, feelings of unhappiness and severe melancholia of the type in which people turn their head to the wall uh, and, and are prepared to die and um, don't eat or, or alternatively have Cotard syndrome or something like that. Um, but there's no, uh, you can't take a blood test and say, um, this person is severely depressed and that person is merely mildly unhappy and unhappy for, uh, um, in circumstances which would make anyone unhappy. But it, used to, uh, it used to be quite easy to admit somebody to observe them in a, in a hospital. Yes. Uh, and now that's, it's impossible. Uh, that's become very difficult. You, you, you now, well, you, yeah. Yeah. Because there are so few places. The beds have been closed, etc. Yes, yeah. that's right. All, all you've got is mad axe men inside. Well, that's not... You can't really admit a depressed person <laughs> to a ward full of mad axe men. <laughs> no, nobody wants, nobody wants that for their mother or their... Wife, so why do you why do you think both of you why do you think that it's so easy or it seems it's so easy for people to just go to the doctor saying i'm not feeling very happy and um you get to leave with some antidepressants how how come that's well, so well, easy? Part, partly it's the conditions under which doctors have to work i mean i'm not i don't have any easy solution to this but if you've got five or ten minutes someone comes to you and says 
you know, I'm not happy. Uh, and so, well, they don't say I'm, I'm depressed. You don't really have any, <clears throat> you don't have much time to investigate it, to look into it. And furthermore, there's very little that you could do, even if you had the time. So, um, and after all, giving people something to take does have a positive, often positive placebo effect. Um, so the temptation, I think, is to, to cut things short and, uh, and, and, and give medicine partly because the doctor doesn't know what else to do. And, and there's expectation you're going to do something. Yes. Just, just to finish the conversation. Uh, yes. yes. Well, so I, I, I can understand it. I don't think it's a good thing, but I can understand how it happens. One, one of the difficulties of this is that talking about it is, is, quite, is quite kind of gloomy. And, you know, as you say, there's, there are no easy solutions. And yet, um, you know, we have just been talking about it, you know, with kind of hilarity, really, because, um, you, you know, you're left, you're left helpless in grotesque situations, aren't you? Which people object to, don't they? They will object to the fact that we're laughing, I'm sure. Well, some I, people... I fear that that might be the case. There's a tremendous misunderstanding about how to survive in this world where, it's so, where you're trying to help people, but it's so difficult to do so. Um, well, I, uh, yes. I mean, I often think that, um, that it would be a good idea if people read Dr. Johnson's Rasselas. I don't know whether you know Rasselas. Never read it, no. Never read no, it. Well, it's a, I mean, it, of course, for most people, it would be rather difficult because it's in 18th century English. But the whole point of the book is that there is no perfect life for man and that the, perfect, and that the permanent condition of mankind is dissatisfaction because he is a prey to different desires which are not mutually compatible. Mm. So that, for example, I might want to be... I want excitement but I also want security well you can't have both all the time mm. you, you have to make a choice and uh, and this uh, furthermore people have no awareness of, of the tragic dimension of life so that any uh, decline from perfection, any deviation from perfection is experienced as something completely abnormal and terrible mm. Are you saying uh, that people currently don't have an awareness of yes. the tragic aspect of life. Yes, I think so. Which is different from previous generations, do you think? Uh, partly because we are unfamiliar with death. I mean, you can go, most people probably go to the age of 70 without ever having seen a dead body, for example. Uh, whereas years ago, that would not have been the case. And uh, we parked death in hospitals um, we are, um, um, despite despite COVID, uh, we are uh, we are the healthiest, most secure people who've ever lived in the history of humanity. But we don't actually uh, know that or don't appreciate it. And um, so, a dose uh, of hardship might be beneficial. Do you think? Uh, well, I think it's a it difficult would be philosophy, wrong. isn't it, to pursue? <laughs> it's, it's, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think you could say to a patient, well, what I think you need is a, a bit of hardship. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, and why can't you say it? Uh, uh, well, it would be very difficult to describe. Uh, the to GMC the, wouldn't uh, like it. Yeah, it wouldn't. Yeah. It would be very difficult to dose, wouldn't it? So, yeah, give exactly the correct doses that would put a little moral fibre into people. Well, but that's not a very interesting. Them. That's a very interesting challenge, isn't it? Is how do you provide a level of stress or a level of challenge for people, which they can survive and cope with and learn from, rather than be crushed by? Um, well, it's, uh, it's very difficult because we live in a society which is obsessed with safety. Mm. So if you, uh, and, uh, and you can understand why, because, um, uh, you know, if you take the, the recent vaccination um, uh, situation where people have got very exercised about, uh, about um, uh, cerebral thrombosis after, uh, some kind of thrombosis after, the AstraZeneca mm. uh, injections. Um, uh, 
people, if you say, well, actually, the, 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 the chances of this are very, very small, and it's probably you know, more dangerous to cross the road or, or something than that, certainly to, for young people to cross the road or for, to drive and so on. And probably they say, more dangerous to get the infection. But still, yes, yes, yeah. Well, that's the primary thing, of course. Yeah. Although it gets more difficult as you go down the age group, yes. because of course the the disease itself is not very serious most of the time. Yes. Anyhow, people will always come back to you and say, "Well, what if it's you?" You know what? Mm-hmm. And of course, I mean, you can't say, "Well, I I don't mind if it's me." I mean, that would be absurd. Yeah. So, so the question then is, how do you get round this? Because once you, once people say, "Well, what if it's you?" If you say, "Well, we have to take these risks," uh, there are some things. Let's take sport, for example. Mm-hmm. For the moment at least, or for many, for a long time, we've been prepared to accept the risks of sport. But actually, sport is one of the biggest causes of accident uh, in, in our times. And so some, of them, some of them are serious. Mm. Now, we, we accept that because we think that sport is good for people. But I don't know how long we're going to accept that. And um, people want kind of absolute safety. It's getting safer all the time, of course, because you can now use, in uh, you know, information technology to do your sport. You don't have to go out and actually play tennis. To do it, yes. You do it in the sitting room. Yes. So it's, it's getting safer. <laughs> yes. Anyhow, I mean that. So uh, yeah. there is this uh, problem that life ought to be completely safe. You know, there should be no no hazards, and um, and so on, and. Um, and and we are unfamiliar with uh, with uh, death. And do you do do you carry this into your personal life? Do you challenge yourself with hardships in order to keep your edge? Well, uh, not really. But when I was young, I I when I say a young, I mean young adult. Um, I actually had a taste for danger. Right. I mean, uh, I had the young man's idea that actually I would survive the danger. It wasn't that I was suicidal or anything like that. Sure. But I used to like going into civil wars and things like that, which obviously was not the uh, the best way to, to ensure a long life. But I had this belief that I would survive, and I did survive. And you can and see then... something of how the world actually works when it's not safe. Yes. Uh, and to some extent, inoculate yourself against the fear of danger. Uh, yes. Raise your I, thresholds, in other words, for being fearful. I think it might have, yes. I mean, I wasn't very anxious to begin with. So, I mean, people vary in the, their levels of anxiety by nature. So, and I, anxiety, I was never particularly anxious. Um, and you put yourself out there by writing books with your opinions in them. Um, rather than keeping quiet. Um, yes, I mean, I've never really felt that, that there was any danger attached to that. I mean, although we live in uh, times where people seem to be getting more intolerant, I've never actually suffered anything as a result of saying something unpopular. Maybe and, because you don't seem that vulnerable. Uh, no. I mean, uh, I, of course, I don't do uh, Twitter or... Um, Mm. Or Facebook. So, I mean, there may be millions of people writing hate messages for all up there. <laughs> you get letters in green ink, do you? <laughs> oh, well, I that in the old days when I used to before the uh, social media, I used to get uh, letters, um, and I, I mean, you could tell the mad ones in green ink with, uh, with, uh, with, with envelopes that have been cut in two and sellotaped in order to economise. <laughs> <laughs> and and with, with very variable size of writing, and they were clearly mad. But you never got the kind of nastiness that you see on... The, I mean, people would disagree with you. But, but they'd have... They'd have picked up their pen and they posted a letter, so they'd obviously reflected, and that helped them to keep their 
anger or disagreement within civilized bounds. But, but I, think, now, I, I think what you're, what we're talking about is actually very important. So, although it it, it can sound a bit um, like silly ideas, there's 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 plenty of um, examples in the world of how exposing yourself to a degree of hardship makes you stronger as long as it's done in a way which allows that and doesn't actually damage you too much. I mean, the simple, the simple action of taking strenuous exercise usually makes people feel better afterwards. So you, you, you get that example immediately. But um, it, it's probably true about uh, all, all sorts of aspects of life that if you give yourself enough of a challenge but overcome it, you end up stronger as a result and less vulnerable. Well, I wouldn't go as far as Nietzsche, who said, you know, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. No, well, I don't I think, think that's true. I, I, think, I don't think that's true. Killing, killing is no. probably a bit extreme. You don't need to. Yes, yes. There's, um, uh, there's uh, a kind of analogy, I and mean, there's one theory as to why there's so much asthma and... and yeah, um, yep. not uh, enough dirt. Not enough dirt. So, in a way, what we're talking about is laudable dirt. How much, <laughs> how much dirt do you need? Uh, not to, to damage a child, uh, but on the other hand, uh, to protect it from uh, becoming hypersensitive. Now, I don't know whether I, I'm not an immunologist, so I don't know wh- whether there's any real basis to this to this idea. Um, but certainly it seems, for example, if you expose young children to peanuts very early in their lives, they become their, their chances of becoming having a peanut allergy are much less than if you carefully sweep the floor every day searching for peanuts. But I think it's, it's kind of obvious, and it, it's, it's part of physiology as well as psychology, that if you don't use it, you lose it. In other words, if you don't exercise those parts of your nervous system which which tolerate stress you 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 lose the ability to tolerate stress just as your muscles lose their ability to tolerate exercise it seems obvious yes but it it would be it's difficult uh, i think it would be slightly difficult to prove but even if you could prove it it would then be a question of well, how, how much stress and what kind of stress and is it uh, different for different people as well Yes, but if you started asking those questions, you could answer them. Nobody's even asking the questions. Mm. Yes, I, I mean, I think it might be quite difficult to do ethical experiments <laughs> on this. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think this, this. I don't think it's this game we're going to start at our ages. Uh, yeah. can, can, I, can I go back and, and um, t- a little bit more about what what you think? Because I'm I'm sure what you think you said to a lot of your patients, whether they were at the hospital or in the prison. Yes, and, and those things that other people might find terribly rude or offensive, they didn't, or or not yeah. many of them did. It sounds from what I've, I've no heard no. From I, you. Very few. I mean, there were a few people uh, who uh, who were beyond uh, being told anything uh, that yeah. I thought, you know, that it would obviously be either harmful or dangerous or something. But on the whole, I found that people were almost relieved that I talked to them. Actually, I talked to them just like I'm talking to you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't put them in a different category, uh, like I didn't put the prisoners in a different category. No, uh, um, and I think that's what people understand. They they see that. Um, I I saw that with clients. If you actually engaged with them and listened to them, and then gave advice, and even if the advice wasn't what they wanted to hear, they accepted it in the main. Yes. Yeah. And um, probably respected you more for speaking the truth. I think so. I th- I think so. And and you didn't you didn't try and make the pill sweeter just because you felt sorry for them. Yes. Um, because ultimately, things can go very wrong in the criminal justice system. And you know, if you haven't made people aware of the possibilities, like one of them is going to prison, um, you're not being honest with them, and it doesn't do them. It doesn't help. Well, people at all. respect that, don't they? I think well, it, yeah. I had a lot of. I mean, this is, of course, again, um, 
people would find this rather difficult to um, to accept. But I had lots and lots of women, enormous numbers of women, who had been very badly abused by their uh, boyfriends, usually boyfriends more than husbands, and. <clears throat> And uh, a level of abuse that I, I actually had never expected. And it came as, I was shocked, if I can so put it. Um, <laughs> but not in shock. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, but it, it, <laughs> I thought it was important to examine how this situation had become had come about, because if you didn't examine how it came about, how could you make sure that, or how could you even begin to think about how to make sure that it didn't happen again? Yeah. So and, what did you find? Well, uh, what I, I found, of course, is that an enormous amount of this abuse was uh, uh, the the women were complicit with it in some way or other. Oh, they dear. did. You're going to have women's aid on your back now. <laughs> well, you see, I thought it's important. It's not that, of course, I thought this abuse was terrible. Mm. I mean, uh, I, I wasn't excusing it. I thought it was terrible. And in many cases, I wished these monsters had gone to prison and, and so on and so forth. But that doesn't help the, the woman in front of you. You have to find that, try and find a way of helping the woman escape from her condition, if that's what she wants, um, and not to get into another situation similar. Yeah. So um, the only way to do that, I could see, is to, to, to get the woman to see how she had actually... Um, uh, fallen, if you like, fall, not fallen, walked into this situation often with her eyes open. So that, for example, I would say to a woman, how long would it take me to realize that the man that you're with, I mean, he wasn't there, how long would it take me to realize that he was no good? And she said, well, you'd see it immediately. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> Apart from anything else, because he had something like fuck off to toot on his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not in mirror writing, of course. Well, sometimes I did have one in mirror writing. You said, you, said, you said it helped to wake him up in the morning. <laughs> it, <laughs> but would. Yeah. it would. I suppose it would. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. <laughs> I would say, well, did, did you? Did it not occur to you that this, you know, this is this man is unlikely to be St. Francis of Assisi? <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and, and they would uh, they would accept that because it's obvious. It it's obviously obvious. true. It's yeah. obviously true. And then you would say, well, how did you meet this man? And he said, well, you know, I met him in the club. And I said, well, how long was it before you decided to go out with him or even live with him? And often it was half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and fundamentally, <laughs> the only person you can change is yourself. Um, yes. You, you, yes. Can't, you can't sit about being determined to change other people. And then you see, the, the, the thing is that, I, I mean, the, they would come in crying and go out laughing because good. It, it, it was absurd what they, you know, and, uh, and of course there were, there were, you know, there were cases that were far too terrible for, for this kind of approach. But, but this, is, this is the same now with dating apps, isn't it? Because, I mean, the, I don't, I haven't ever used one, but... You know, the attitude is that you can kind of put an advert about yourself <laughs> on a website and you can find these potential people who are interested in you and you have sex within, you know, three the dates. first time. Three dates. <laughs> three dates. Three dates, is it? And then that's it, you know. It's the same thing. And then they wonder in three what months' time or two <laughs> years' time how it is that they've married somebody who's, you know, busy. Well, I mean, there was a kind of ultimate example of this. I don't know whether you remember this. 
um, a man <laughs> called Shane Jenkins. I mean, this is too. Ter- this is just terrible. Uh, a man called Shane Jenkins came out of prison. He was a six foot four muscular man uh, uh, who had, I think, kicked somebody's head in and, uh, and, and injured him for life. Anyway, this a woman uh, found him very attractive. And she subsequently wrote a book about it. I don't know with what help, but anyway, she she, she was uh, she was um, she was not she was not unintelligent. She was not a stupid uh, not stupid in the sense of being lacking IQ. When she first saw this man, she saw on his chest some terrible. She knew he'd come out of prison having seriously injured somebody. And he had on his chest some kind of tattoo of terrible violence. I forget what it was. He watched terrible, uh, I think they're called snuff movies. Right, one, yeah. one, for example, of a woman having her eyes put out by a man. Um, he was violent to her, so violent that uh, the police, she called the police 11 times and always withdrew the charges. But one time the police insisted to, that she went through with the charges. And then she lied in the, in the witness box and said, I fell down the stairs. She was you know, injured. Um, and the judge took the unprecedented uh, step. I think I've never heard of this before. He called her into his chambers and said, I hope you're, you don't live to regret this. And um, anyway, this man, uh, she was far from uh, perfect. She, she had two children, of course, by two different men. And uh, nevertheless, she left them in the charge of this man. She went out, got so drunk uh, that when she came back, she was unconscious in the bed and vomited in the bed without knowing that she'd done that. I mean, with two small children, whom she'd left in the in the, the the care of this man, whom she knew to be a monster, really. Um, anyway, eventually he drugged her. He uh, he um, uh, got her drunk and did put her eyes out with his hand, with his fingers, <clears throat> and blinded her. Uh, uh, and of course, you see her. I mean, it's pitiful. And she said, this time he went too far. Good that, Lord. You know, this time he went too far. And the man, instead of getting... I mean, personally, I think the only just thing for this man would be to send him to prison for the rest of his life with absolutely no possibility of him ever coming out. Instead of which, he got a life sentence with a recommendation that he stayed in prison for at least six years. So in other words, after six years, this man could come out. Now, that's, uh, I think that's terrible. This man should never come out of prison. And it's not a question of whether he says, sorry, uh, sorry, I now realize that putting people's eyes out with my fingers is wrong. Yeah. Is, is wrong. <laughs> and I promise not to do it again. I mean, <laughs> The, the, you know, prison isn't isn't therapy. Anyway, what can you say about a woman like that? Can you say she, she she had no part to play in the whole situation? She she chose, and, and people told her, "Do not touch this man with a barge pole." Now, very often, people are carrying a generational problem. That is, that they've had some experience in childhood which makes them seek out that kind of relation, not, not perhaps as bad as that, but very often seek out a relationship which doesn't function well because their childhood experience was dysfunctional. Yeah. That, that's true. But on the other hand, I had patients, for example, who said, I mean, some said I'm violent because I came from a violent background, but I also had patients who said I would never, men who said I would never hit a woman because I saw my father hit my mother. Mm. Well, yes, but <clears throat> I've heard and, people say that, and then they hit a woman. So, it's, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's you know. true, but, 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 but I mean, the fact is that if any boy, we have at some, well, we have at some time to accept, try and accept responsibility. Oh, I'm not for, suggesting uh, there's no responsibility. I'm simply saying it's, yes. it's understandable. It's um, yeah. and, and, you know, in the same light of you saying, well, understand where these problems come from is the only way you're going to find a way of actually dealing yes. with it. It's it's not it's not excusing it. Of course, you have to take responsibility yes. for your behaviour as an adult. 
but it is yes. understandable, which is a different thing from being. Excusable. Well, I think it's. I think it's very important to 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 get across that when you are inquiring into the 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 development of the situation, if you like, you are actually concerned for the person. Yes, it's not just that you're saying, uh, "Oh, you stupid person," you know. Uh, you're just foolish, but you are actually concerned for them. And it's much, much easier to say there, there, how terrible everything is. And you've got, you've got no part to play in it. But they you know you're a fool it. if you say that to somebody with that kind of life experience. There, there, how terrible it is. They'll dismiss you as a lightweight of no significance because you've not understood them. <laughs> Well, it, uh, yeah, I think it's more complicated than that because, of course, you can derive certain benefits from people just treating you as a victim as, and nothing else. Well, yes, but they'll uh, use you. They won't. They won't yeah, respect they'll use you. you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. I think. I think so. Um, but anyway, so it's a, it's a if you like, it's a delicate uh, path to yes. tread. Yes, yes. Because you don't want to seem as if you're actually uh, underplaying the rawness of their experience, which may be terrible. This is where a word like yeah. judgmental fails, isn't it? Because yes. you, you don't want to be what people say, judgmental in inverted commas. Well, it's in fact, you have to be judgmental. You have to well, make I'm, a judgment. Well, I mean, if it weren't terrible, you wouldn't be talking to these yeah, people right. in the first place. What they mean by judgmental is censorious. Yes, yes. that's the right word, yes. They're, they're, this is what, why it's necessary for people to be able to speak their own language properly, because censoriousness and judgmental, not a failure, the unwillingness to make a judgment are not the same thing. In fact, you can't, you can't fail to make a judgment. I mean, that's the whole thing about being a human being. You make judgments all the time. You make judgments, not only uh, moral judgments, but aesthetic judgments. And it's impossible for you not to do so. Yeah. Yes. We agree. Yeah. We agree. Well, I think, I think we need to wind it up, actually, Theodore, because yes. you've given us a lot of your time. And um, Thank you very much. We thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you.